There are multiple ways to keep in touch with the Wolf Connection podcast. Through our Instagram handle, the Wolf Connection Pod, and for comments and questions, send us an email to podcast at wolfconnection.org with your comments, questions, and guest ideas for Stephen and myself. You may hear your question answered on an upcoming podcast. Thank you for your support and howls to you all. Welcome to the Wolf Connection Podcast. I'm your host, John Calvin. Let's talk about some more. So we finally got all of our schedules together, uh, and we are very thrilled and excited to have this gentleman here with us. He is the director of Seaforth Expeditions up in Seashelt, British Columbia. Uh, he's the captain. He's done so many wonderful things. They have a documentary coming out uh, on Netflix on October 11th, which we'll get to. But he is Tom McPherson. Tom, awesome to have you, man. How are you doing? Um, really good. Thanks. And uh, yeah, I know it's been a bit of a challenge to get a hold of me. So <laughs> <laughs> I apologize for that. <laughs> it's all good. No, man, no apologies needed. You have You have a lot of stuff going on. And I'm sure business has certainly picked up now that people are allowed to go and, and do things and be outside. <laughs> Just to g- give everybody a sense of your background, because I was looking up a little bit of your bio on the website. Were you were you born and raised up there in BC? How did you get started as a mariner? This whole thing, go for it. Yeah, I guess a little background life story. Um, I was actually born in Ontario, but when I was a baby, we moved out west. Uh, my parents moved to the west side of Vancouver Island to a spot that's pretty much isolated. (laughs) So I spent my first uh, six years pretty much growing up in the wilderness, uh, fishing off the dock every day, playing on the beach every day. My dad was running a fuel dock in a remote location. Um, And that really, I think, set me on the course for my life. Um, But when we were six, I needed to get into school and that sort of thing. And my parents were worried about me being socialized properly. So (laughs) Uh, we moved back to Ontario. I did all my elementary year, years there. And then um, uh, BC was calling us. So we moved back to uh, BC and the Sunshine Coast. And um, yeah, I've kind of been on the Sunshine Coast ever since, aside from a bit of time in Vancouver for college, where I studied outdoor recreation management. Um, and yeah, so that's kind of like a <laughs> quick synopsis of, uh, <laughs> yeah, I guess my background. But uh, those early years, as I mentioned, they, they really did, uh, I think they really ingrained in me a passion for the wilderness and being outside and that sort of thing. And I have my parents to thank for that. And yeah, it's really mm-hmm. come full circle for me. Wow. What is... You all of your background in, you know, you were a commercial trawler, uh, sailing tall ships, you know, your coastal knowledge, like you said, how does that impact, how do those skills really transfer over to what you wanted to start with Seaforth Expeditions? You must have so much, you know, firsthand experience of how to do that. So what was that, what was that journey like going from, like you say, your, your teenage years, your formative years to then wanting to start? see forth and do what you're doing now yeah yeah i think um um i went yeah my late teens i uh like i was uh i used to race motocross um and uh that was a huge part of my life uh that consumed me for all of my adolescence uh so it made it nearly to the professional level but then in my early 20s, realized I wasn't really going to make it without more support and less injuries. <laughs> so um, <laughs> so I, I quit that and uh, I immediately filled the void by getting back into the wilderness. Um, and yeah, I saved up a bunch of money for university, but couldn't really figure out what I wanted to do there. Um, so I took that money and went traveling and just spent, spent, <laughs> all of it on activities you know i was yeah caving and uh sea kayaking and mountaineering and skydiving and i just i just blew it all on fun activities <laughs> <laughs> and i was on tall ships and traveling around the world and in new zealand and i came back and i realized i wanted to be a guide so in effect it was money well spent um and that's been the trajectory ever since so following that trip 
I found the Outdoor Recreation Management Program at Capilano College in North Vancouver. And I did their program and um, decided that kind of the smartest, I always had like, uh, my dad was a boat builder. Um, and so being on the water and my early upbringing and that sort of thing, the ocean was always a big part of our lives. Um, and uh, so coming out of that program, I re realized that it would be probably a smart move for me to pursue a career as a mariner. Um, so I got my, uh, or I got a job with a company that Blue Water Adventures that does nature tours up and down the coast. Um, and so with working with them and BCIT, uh, the Marine Insti Training Institute, I got my captain's license after a few years and um, started leading these trips. Uh, pretty heavily focused on bear guiding and whale watching and that sort of thing. And we were covering the entire coast of BC from the Gulf Islands up to Prince Rupert, uh, including Haida Gwaii, where we would do quite a few trips with that company and um, worked with them for nine years doing that sort of thing. And then um, eventually ended up uh, transferring over to another company that was more specialized in grizzly and black bear viewing and they focused more so on photo tours so in all i think i ended up running these big sailboats for uh 14 years or so um and you know it's an amazing experience because you're a jack of all trades when you're there they're well i call them big but they're they all capped out at about 70 feet which isn't huge for a boat but um at that level my position was to do be able to do everything essentially you know you're you're the plumber you're the electrician you're the mechanic you're the sailor you're the bear guide the zodiac driver and sometimes the you know therapist <laughs> you know? and then the disciplinarian as well <laughs> you know? so, uh it's a big role and it it just you know, that experience and all that time on the water up and down the coast and all that time with bears um, really was the essentially the training for launching Seaforth expeditions. Um, it took me longer to get there than I ever anticipated, but um, uh, but I think it was the process. Um, it was the right path for sure. Um, just because I feel like I came in with to what I'm doing now with a lot of skills um, that I wouldn't have had if I, you know, somehow managed to do it any other way. So, yeah. How was the how was the name Seaforth decided on? Yeah, so it's kind of an interest. There's a bit of a story there too, um, but um, I was at, at a certain point in my career. Um, uh, I was I was actually in Seaforth Channel, and I'd been really wanting a higher level of adventure um, than what I was getting on these trips because these seventy foot sailboats are pretty comfortable, and we don't have to sail; we can motor. You know, if we 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 would motor a lot, and I just wanted to do something um, uh, more gritty, actually. Um, and uh so i was i had a captain friend that i was working with at the time and we were just brainstorming what we you know what that would look like and he and i almost bought a few boats together but um i decided that i wanted to um start a company that um led trips uh by sail and oar, like human and wind powered trips and so i designed or why well, I developed a concept for a boat and then had a, had a naval architect design it. So I built this 35, well, it's 35 on deck uh, foot uh, schooner out of aluminum. And uh, that was the beginning of Seaforth Expeditions. So we built, I built this schooner um, that was designed for wind and human powered expeditions. And we had this race on the coast from uh, it starts in Port Townsend and ends in Ketchikan. It's the race to Alaska. And as soon as I heard about that thing, I I wanted to be a part of that. So it fit my business and model or business idea and boat perfectly. So it took me a couple of years to build this thing. And 
yeah, went broke numerous times <laughs> trying to finish it. <laughs> but we did get it done and we got it into the 2019 race to Alaska. And um, it was an amazing adventure. Um, we went day and night uh, with a crew of seven and um, took us, uh, well, the race starts in Port Townsend and there's like a, a qualifier uh, to get to Victoria because you have to clear customs and all that sort of thing. But you also need to make sure that the people that are heading up the coast without a motor know what they're doing because it's <laughs> not, you know, it's there's significant bodies of water and challenges that you have to pass to get to Ketchikan. Um, so anyways, the real race is sort of from Victoria to Ketchikan and it's 700 nautical miles, I believe. Um, I think we worked out that we ended up rowing about 400 of those nautical miles. <laughs> and then oh, we didn't have That's a lot of out. wind. Yeah. And so and we averaged around two knots or so rowing with this big boat. Uh, and yeah, it took us nine and a half days to get there. Uh, um, Crazy. But yeah, so that was, that is a big segue and that's been kind of the, the direction of Seaforth because <laughs> um, I always had this passion for wolves um, and um, I was contacted by the Knowledge Network, uh, which is a local broadcaster here. Um, they wanted some help uh, doing wolves and I was advertising it um, and I had a pack that I'd kind of been working with and having some success with. So um, uh, we, yeah, we had to bring them out. And um, the only, but I ran into a problem with my boat in that the area I was finding the wolves, there was nowhere for me to safely keep a boat because we're on the west side of Vancouver Island. There's no safe anchorages anywhere nearby. Um, if I had have brought the boat in there, it would have been certainly destroyed. So uh yeah we came up with you know ended up camping on beaches and things like that um and not using the boat at all <laughs> and it's not really been a part of the operation <laughs> since that race so um yeah we're currently looking at a way to bring it back to life but i might be selling it to a buddy or something like that <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah so when wow. yeah so when you when you do these expeditions what's what does it entail? Give everybody just a little bit of a background of what people are dealing with. Because you talked about the coastline and things like that. But yeah, just give everybody the topography, the environment. You know, when you go on these tours and you're looking for these wolves, what's the, what are people in for, basically? Yeah, so the, the current situation is uh, I essentially have a base camp. Uh, I call it a camp, um, but it's, it's not glamping, but it's almost, it is glamping in some ways glamping <laughs> you know it's not as bad as <laughs> camping uh we have a yeah, a yeah heated building and you know water we collect off a roof and stuff like that so I've, I've got a base camp that's pretty well situated um for this pack um and this pack as far as i can tell i've measured the distance of the places that i know they go along the coastline they're covering over 100 kilometers of coastline uh on the west side of the island um and so uh yeah it's a very rugged challenging environment you know it's wet a lot of the time um and then yeah you're dealing with the open ocean coming in um so there's been times where i you know i find the wolves in a place that's quite challenging to access and it's meant that we've worked extremely like extremely hard to get people into the right spot because uh that's basically what it takes to be successful it takes an incredible amount of stubbornness um but it also it varies sometimes sometimes they happen to be near my base camp and that's really wonderful it makes things a lot easier um but yeah you know you've got the open ocean there we've got our reef infested area that i spend a lot of time cruising around um so the kind of depth of local knowledge i think and 
and skill sets around managing the tides and all that stuff comes into play to be successful. Um, and yeah, I've been fortunate to be able to put a lot of time in out there. Um, but uh, yeah, and then they're semi nocturnal as well, right? So um, they're, they're, yeah, very challenging species to be pursuing, but um, our success rate's been really, really high, I would say. Um, and uh, yeah, um, kind of losing the train there. <laughs> um, yeah. Yes, speaking of that, I mean, it's I mean, incredibly difficult species to track down and then not to mention get a good photo of, but your Instagram is just full of great photos of, of wolves. So how do you, how do you go about the photography aspect? Um, like how, how, do you set up somewhere, you just post up, you wait for wolves to show up. Are you tracking wolves on the ground? Are you, uh, is it, are a lot of your photos been, it's being taken from the actual vessel while you're, you know, coasting by the coastline or how, how do you, how do you go about the, the, the photography? Yeah, it is certainly a little bit, all of the above. Um, for me, I, um, I, I spend a lot of time hiking. Uh, um, I've, with the film crews I was working with, I, I basically, you know, we generally, you know, get to the camp, uh, and then as soon as we're, kind of settled it's time to go for a walk <laughs> you know um and i'm just scanning the beaches and i know i with the amount of time i've put in i've figured out some of their favorite spots kind of thing so i i know the hot spots to go check and if i don't find them there then i'm getting in the boat and going somewhere else um but in general i i spent i personally spend a lot of time walking um it's not uncommon for me to do anywhere from 10 to 20 kilometers a day is uh, not out of the question. Yeah, it's usually 20 is a little on the high end. Uh, my highest is 35, <laughs> you know, um, that's when I really couldn't find them. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, we're in for a long walk now. But, what about um, sign? What about sign on on the coast like that? Do you see a lot of sign, or does it just get? Is just the environment just not keep it for very long? It just gets washed away. Oh, it's it's very challenging. Um, yeah, there's many pluses and minuses. Um, so, uh, you know, we will often have tracks erased by the tide or the heavy rain, which is great because then you know uh, it gives you fresh data. You know, um, so if we, you know, we know we have fresh tracks, if we get some new tracks after a rainfall or something like that. Um, certainly scat is an indicator, but it's, I've seen, you know, some of that scat will last easily two to three months. Um, and so when I first come back, if I've been away for a little while, I'm, I, I, scat's not a great indicator for me in general. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, I'm looking for <laughs> fresh tracks mainly. Yeah. Um, and then just always trying to find the highest level of activity that I can. Um, and, uh, you know, once I find those, then depending on what we're doing, then I'm some, you know, I'm often, well, pushing into the trails a bit to, you know, try and understand how they're using the landscape, which has been really interesting because that's, that's kind of a thing that's, not really well understood um, is how they how they're using the forests and that sort of thing. Um, I kind of liken it to uh, it's like whale watching in a way, um, but where the whales don't have to come up for air. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like um, we see them on the beaches, and that's you know generally where they're coming up for air, so to speak. Um, um, but yeah, it's been quite interesting to be in the forest following their their incredible like spider web kind of trails that they they carve through the forest and that sort of thing. I assume they're eating smaller seafood. I mean, not obviously not all the time, but I assume they they eat a lot of smaller seafood on the coast. Do you are you seeing a lot more just individual animals because they're hunting smaller stuff, or or do you generally see the pack? I mean, are you seeing everyone together? Yeah, it's a it's a mixed bag in that regard again. Um, uh, you know, I, anytime we see the pack together, that's 
feels pretty lucky and fortunate. Uh, we tend to see them generally traveling, you know, in smaller numbers. Um, um, but yeah, um, they, um, they, they really do like the, their lives revolve around the tides. Um, so I'm pretty careful when I'm, you know, picking my trip dates to make sure I'm picking tides that work well, um, for light and, and, you know, that sort of thing. Um, you don't want to have your best lows in, in the middle of the night, ideally, but sometimes you can't, there's nothing you can do about it. Um, but, um, yeah, so I'm very much aware of the tide situation when I'm planning and, and uh, like, you know, for trips in the future and then in the moment in the day to day, we have to work around the tides a lot. Um, it really affects our travel sometimes. Um, but, uh, yeah, so when the tide goes out, the that's when they're kind of cruising the shorelines looking for a meal that's washed in. And um, there's been numerous times where I've seen them, like, you know, just cruising along a line of kelp, and then they stop and dig something out and pull out a huge fish and <laughs> just like, take off. And it's just like, <laughs> you know, you, you're not expecting that. And I've seen that sort of thing happen a few times. And we've had uh, quite a few dead whales wash in and so we uh that's been a you know sometimes a an anchoring point for them um <clears throat> uh, and keeps them coming back but at the same time we've seen them mousing like right next to a whale you know so they're going after little mice and that sort of thing and um it's just really interesting to see that essentially how they use a whale um because uh, it's not, it doesn't guarantee success by any means. Um, uh, and they're just so versatile and so capable and they know their environment so well. Um, they're getting food everywhere they go. And I think they they can't help themselves, but go on patrols and, and the, the hunt other prey and find that diversity that they need in their diet. Um, yeah, we're always learning out there, which is really, really fun. Yeah, that's wild. That's totally wild. What a cool I mean, color. You were talking about, I mean, Stephen was, you know, not wrong at all. Your inst your guys' Instagram is full of incredible stuff. I know you sent Stephen and I uh, a couple of photos. I know you wanted to talk about a little bit. Yeah. Here. I mean, I mean, the, the first one I got pulled up is the one um, it looks like he's going through a bunch of kelp beds and stuff like that. He's just sort of walking towards the camera and like, it looks like in, you know, sort of very shallow oh, water there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. just like, what is it? What is the, I, yeah, I know it's incredible. Just the, and yeah, for those of you that are, that are not following C4 expedition on, on Instagram, you should, I mean, that the photos of not just the wolves, but just of all the, the wildlife that these guys capture is just incredible on photo. It's amazing. But what's, I mean, tell us yeah. about, about these guys. I mean, like you said, it, 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 a lot of the yeah. photos you sent with us are solo. I think there's one, one or two with, uh, there's a pup and then there's uh, a trio that we'll get to in a minute. But what just, what's, what's it like trying to capture a photo like this? So you, are you on the beach? Are you in an elevation? I mean, what, what kind of stuff are you using to get the, a shot like this? Yeah, so um, these those first shots, um, my, I was just well, I, I know the order basically that I sent them in, but um, <laughs> yeah. uh, the um, the one where it's coming towards you in the um, uh, uh, through the intertidal area um, mm. for me that that shot just kind of screams coastal wolf. He's like he's in the tide essentially you've got the ocean in the background and you know a bit of epic old growth forest and in, in there as well um and um so that was one of my first amazing encounters um and i was um out basically i had a film crew coming in they hadn't arrived yet and i had um my wife at the time and family with me, <laughs> my wife and kids were with me. 
Um, and I had just gone out for a walk to <laughs> look for look for sign and try and figure out how they're using the area where the hotspots are. And it was one of my very first trips and photo shoots that I was guiding essentially. I kind of knew what I was looking for. But uh, anyway, so I was just out on the beach and um, there's these shelves that go out for almost, some of them are over a kilometer. And um, I hadn't noticed it, but there was actually a wolf out there like cruising around. And then, and then I was like kind of in the middle of a big open space. And I was like, and I noticed this, you know, wolf on my far right. And I was just like, oh, wow, you know, <laughs> I'm just gonna, I guess I'm gonna stop, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I just stopped and uh, I was near, uh, uh, there was like a, a couple large boulders that were close to me. So I just kind of tucked into those. And um, wow, because I wasn't, uh, I didn't really want to disturb him from what he was doing, you know? So, um, but then he was cruising by and he was probably two or 300 yards away. He's quite a ways away. But he just saw me and just and I just remember this moment where he was like traipsing along, you know, the horizon. And then he just noticed me, turned and came straight at me. And uh, so I was just like, OK, you know, here we go. <laughs> this is exciting. Um, and so he came over and um, oh, actually, it's a she. I don't know what I'm saying. He, <laughs> But uh, anyways, uh, and he or she um, just started investigating me essentially and um, started cruising around me, just doing circles around me over and over and over. And it went on and on, like probably for 10 minutes or so. This wolf was just, just traipsing like in a trot and just like going around in circles, round and round. <laughs> and uh, so I was just crouched on the ground and I was like, I was trying to, I had my camera with me. I was trying to get shots, um, but it was actually quite difficult just with the speed and the size of lens and the proximity <laughs> um, to, to get the shots. But I, I got a few shots, but that shot there is that sort of initial investigation where it just came straight at me from, from a distance and I got what I could. And I was also very new to photography at the time. <laughs> so I was like, um, yeah, uh, I've well, always struggled with some of the stuff, but uh, those ones turned out pretty good. So, yeah. Yeah, man, those photos are beautiful. Is this um, is this po is this population of wolves a hunted population of wolves? Like, are folks out here hunting this group? Um, not not, no, I would say no, they're not. Um, but they certainly, they are at risk of course there's you know there's always that segment of the population that you know has an ego that somehow needs to be satisfied by killing something for no reason um these wolves they in some ways they're somewhat pr protected by their location you know they're just mm -hmm. yeah. that hard to access that there's not a lot of people going out of their way um to go shoot when there's not much reason to do that there uh they i have heard of um uh them running into altercations with uh there's some fishing lodges not too mm. far away and i know another pack that was uh was enticed by the carcasses that the, that the fishing lodge was throwing and this a uh, few members of the pack apparently set up under the deck of this fishing lodge and they decided that the best thing to do was to shoot the wolves. It's yeah. like, you know, it's completely <laughs> asinine, you know, yeah. uh, <laughs> deal with your, you put your carcasses in the crab trap and go get some crabs. Yeah. Like, right. But you guys have never had, you guys have never had any experience that you'd consider conflict with the, with wolves. Yeah, no. Um, I like, I've, I've made some mistakes um that you would think might lead to like a conflict yeah. type situation but uh it's really interesting um just how wolves are with people you know um i've made mistakes and i've never been in a position where i'm like 
you know just not threatening yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. so yeah one of those pictures is a uh, is from a mistake that i made <laughs> but actually two of them are <laughs> but um you know um it's just uh yeah, uh, they're incredibly interesting animals. Just they're they're all individuals, right? And all animals are individuals. Um, but I think wolves give us a they give us a little bit more back than a lot of other species, I would say. Um, and you know, I think with our relationship with dogs, we're a little bit more used to reading their behaviors and things like that and understanding them a bit but um what i find with the wolves is that you know you you'll have some members that are curious and um and you know if you're out there it doesn't matter what you're doing it doesn't matter if you're in a blind or if you know if i'm hiding in the forest edge or something like that um those curious ones will sometimes come over sometimes they won't um and then there's the alpha male of this pack that I work with a fair bit. He he never comes over. He always keeps his distance. Um, he's come within 50 yards, I think, uh, a few times over the years. Um, but that's the, kind of the closest. And um, if I'm have if I'm having or if I have the other wolves around or nearby, if he shows up, um, they all fall in line almost immediately. They just stop whatever they're doing. They'll they'll get up and they'll just follow him and usually it's the end of the experience you know so he really kind of keeps them in line um but uh yeah they're they're just such a dynamic animal and um they kind of give us just enough to keep us coming back kind of thing <laughs> so, yeah. and, and just in a broad sense not not specific numbers or anything but how many visitors do you do these wolves probably get annually are you are you like are you one of a few groups that ends up on these shores yeah no there's um there's there's people that live nearby there's there's some cabins um uh and then the west side of vancouver island gets busy in the summer so i know i wouldn't be surprised if um you know, some of these wolves are, I know some packs are seeing um, like probably around a, a thousand people a summer. Uh, and they're not people that are necessarily, like it's not people who are necessarily going, going for, for the purpose of, being, yeah, like I think, you know, a lot of them would have that hope maybe. And then there's all the, sport fishing that goes on out there and so you know there's sport fishing that's you know near near shore and you know sometimes the wolves are coming down to to forage in the shoreline and i think that's probably where they might be most at risk in a way um because yeah just some of the mentalities you know um that are out there on the water you know not necessarily in line with conservation or respect um yeah but uh, you know i i don't hear about that stuff happening uh i think i would um so i think you know the general population up here is pretty pro wolf i think um uh you know with uh the you know the story of takaya and her being shot and quite a few municip municipalities on vancouver island put a moratorium on the recreational you know hunting of wolves um until essentially there's some i guess knowledge or data you know but even outside of that you know the science stuff it, like we all know that the ecosystem is better with the you know it's healthier with apex predators in it so mm -hmm. you know it just makes no sense um no, I agree. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's crazy. Cause it seems like, again, you, you went to school for outdoor recreation management and your job and your business right now is so much more than that. You are, you're conservation, you're a photographer, you're a guide, you're a researcher in a sense, because you've, you've given us all this data. I mean, what's, what's the science? I mean, it seems like you've become all this, all this stuff has come together for you and melded into this one 
job. Have you felt that, that you're, you're sort of, I don't want to say a protector, but at least you know where these wolves are and how they behave and how to tell other people when they come on one of your expeditions, hey, this is how we treat them and this is how we can, can do it safely. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, you know, it's a, it is a lot of hats in some ways. Um, I do feel like, you know, for me, I, I call it the wolf puzzle. <laughs> it's kind of simple. But, uh, you know, it's just like I'm always out there scratching my head and hiking <laughs> around and trying to figure out what's motivating them to do the things they do. And, um, yeah, uh, I've, you know, we've learned so much uh, over the last little while. And, um, yeah, I kind of really have so much respect for the animal, you know, um, because they have, they because I walk the trails and I try and keep up with them. And, um, you know, it's just like, it's such a challenging thing that they do so easily. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I think uh, there's been some amazing opportunities for conservation with some of the work that I've done. Um, we had uh, Paul Nicklin out and he shot a video uh, which was used uh, by Raincoast to help them push uh, some funding to secure 5,300 square kilometers of the Kitlope, up, which is in the Great Bear Rainforest, to buy up a trophy hunting tenure there. So that was a huge kind of conservation win to, for them to secure that chunk. And it was the amazing work that Paul Nicklin did filming these wolves with me um, and his platform, you know, that you know, helped us secure another little piece of the conservation puzzle up north. And um, so that's where I have a, you know, big sense of pride in having been a part of that. And um, I think uh, for me personally, I'm, I, I see my role as an opportunity to hopefully help change, um, the, you know, people's what they think of when they when they hear wolf, you know, um, and I think this documentary that's coming out on Netflix is going to be, you know, huge in that regard. Um, so, yeah, I think that's. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, I'm losing my voice here, but, but I think that's uh, that's where I see that I can have, a, you know, a fairly significant effect. Maybe is through my images and that sort of thing and the people that I bring and the things that they capture. It shows on everything that, that you guys post and, and really about the mission of what you guys are doing. Talk about that Netflix doc. I believe it's called Island of Wolves, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. That's, that's, that's on Netflix October 11th. But just describe that whole process and what that was about. I mean, the imagery, again, is fa it's unbelievably shot the the wolf parts of it are, are great but really just everything else i mean that they, they had they had eagles in there i believe there were whales and stuff what what's the centric point of the documentary and and is it really just talking about the coastline up there in bc and and all the the wildlife that's there yeah so it's <clears throat> yeah it's very specific to vancouver island and um there was a yeah it was a substantial shoot um there's a lot of they covered a lot of species on it. Um, I think wolves, um, well, I haven't actually seen <laughs> any <Okay>. of it. <laughs> I, I know what they, I've seen okay. the trailer, as I'm sure you know. Um, uh, and I, I know, you know, essentially what they filmed with me. And we had a really interesting year with, with the wolves um, over the course of that filming. And um uh, they managed to capture some really amazing stuff and um, and the storylines. I remember the editor telling me um, that, you know, there it was like a real tearjerker kind of <laughs> uh, at some points, I believe. So because there are some, yeah, their lives are hard. They're so hard. Um, and yeah, we had amazing stuff. We got amazing stuff with the pups and things like that. Um, so I'm really looking forward to seeing how that story unfolds. But 
yeah, I think um, uh, my hope is that, you know, it, it uh, helps people feel maybe if they never felt, you know, empathetic towards a wolf, uh, they might start to feel that way and appreciate them for for the amazing lives that they yeah. lead. Yeah, they do. They, they, and it's so much different, too, than I think any of us who don't live on the coast and really in that Pacific Northwest area is how different to the lives are of, of sea wolves. I mean, they're similar in effect, but very much different than those that are in Yellowstone or in the, in the American West, where people, I think, are used to seeing them and, and seeing one way of their life as opposed to when they're up along the coast and I know when I tell people about that, they go, oh, they live on sea life. And I go, yeah, it's, it's, it's totally, they're so adaptable in that way that they can do these incredible things. I, I wanted to, because you did send us a picture of a pup, because you, you, I know you've mentioned a couple of times, just how did that come about? I, was, that, was that a mistake or was that like, it's just such a, uh, and again, those of you that are listening, follow along. We're going to have all these pictures e- either in the description, on the podcast post. So just as you're, listening to us go along, we'll have all this stuff here so you guys can look at it. But just how did this come about? Because this looks a little bit more inland, no? And not so much on the coastline, or am I wrong here? Yeah, so the pup photo is a bit different. That's uh, one of, uh, that for me is a real conservation photo. Um, And it's also part of a kind of a wild story. Um, But I I was... uh, um, hired to try and find, you know, their den site. It was uh, around the time when they were, uh, they should have been, well, probably just out of the den, essentially. We're, it was, I think that was in July or something like that. Um, but um, yeah, so they would have been out of the den, but I was, I was meant to just locate the pups. Mm. That was my job. <laughs> um, which, you know, <laughs> <laughs> an aerial view of uh, <laughs> of vancouver island it's like in the the haystack if you look at all the views from a satellite can imagine (laughs) it has its challenges um anyways it's nice for people to gamble on me um but um yeah so i was trying to like locate the pack and figure out you know where they where they were um and i I found this stretch of coastline where um, I've been watching it for a little while and there's a lot of tracks along there. Um, I located, I think, eight different trails in and out of the Salal over a few hundred yards. So it was like a a really hot zone. So I just started poking up those trails um, and, you know, trying not to get lost and that sort of thing. Um, But then I went up this one and it was, it was so well done. It was like it was. I say well done because it was, it was obviously a human trail, like you know, it was cut with a chainsaw and it was just like easy walking. And I was like, where is this going? Like I didn't know where it was going. I thought maybe I'd end up at some like awesome surf shack <laughs> or you know, I'm like waiting for right, this cabin right, at exactly. the end kind of thing. Like, it was like insane. Um, and then and there was like a lot of wolf tracks on it and it was had been pretty active and scats and all that stuff so I was getting pretty excited and then um I was kind of going up a hill on this thing and um the tree line I could see the tree line was getting thinner and thinner and I thought oh maybe I'm going to come to like a beautiful lake or something like that um little inland lake or or river or that sort of thing um because there was a river nearby um and then um as I, as the tree line opened up more and more, I realized I was walking into a clear cut. So, you know, and I was just like, oh, you know, then it, then it all made sense. I was like, yeah, loggers cut the trail down to like a really nice beach. I get it. Um, and so I was just like, well, go have a look. And I was like super disappointed. And so I scramble out and it's really challenge it's an old slash pile thing and it's just like really dangerous to walk on actually but um there was this one stump that stood up about 20 feet high and was and it was right near the the end of this trail so i i was i was kind of there's a lot of sign around too like wolf signs so i thought oh you know i just quietly and carefully try and get up on this stump and have a view to see you know just so i can see what i'm surveying the land essentially um and so I 
scramble up on this thing kind of quietly. And um, just as I get on top of this stump, there's this eruption below me. And this big wolf just shoots out <laughs> and pups go everywhere. <laughs> and and he's he's losing his mind and I'm, you know, startled. Um, but yeah, I basically I stumbled onto their rendezvous site and climbed <laughs> upon the stump that the alpha male was hanging out under. And I was just like, he he kind of lost his mind, he, you know, which is totally fair. So um, you know, he blasted out from under there and turned around and he didn't he didn't go far. He went like probably 30 yards or so. And then he turned around and just started like doing a bark howl and alarm call kind of thing. And um I apologized and <laughs> took a quick couple of shots and then um just backed my way out of there and um yeah he kind of howled for another five minutes or so but yeah it was just like this insane kind of moment where um yeah it's just all calm and quiet there was you know i had no idea that stepping I was, into that yeah. you know walking in yeah and that's where i say you know like if you spend enough time out cruising around in the wilderness you know looking for bears or wolves or whatever it is you do make mistakes here and there just you know based on sight lines and things like that but uh so that was one of those but it was just um but uh yeah um the next day i, I came back a little more quietly and carefully uh with a, a friend that i was with and um we hung out we actually hung out there all day and um right when we we were actually leaving that later that afternoon and we were sticking it out at the spot as long as we could before we had to go back and pack up and go and um literally right at the very end this little pup just came running around the road and stopped about 100 yards away and looked at us and so i snapped that photo of him with you know with just the destruction behind him um and yeah for me it's just uh you know, it's it's a very interesting shot. It's a conservation shot. Um, I don't think that everybody understands it when they see it, obviously, but that's the story behind it, is that, you know, here we are with these amazing wolves and their home is being destroyed and they're, they decided to make a rendezvous site at the end of this old cut block where there's, you know, beer cans decorating trees. And, you know, it's just like horrible it was like you know not not what i wanted to see but and it was certainly it is a storyline i'd like to pursue at some point um just to capture that side of it yeah um, it seems like that's something that's up there because when we spoke to cheryl alexander when we we're talking about takea it the logging industry really seems to be the main driver of what's er eroding habitat and things of that sort of there and i know that's that's something that I think her and her uh, the the causes that she fights for with Takea that are really trying to do is is keep the logging out of those out of those coastal areas where the sea wolves are because otherwise those habitats go to waste and they have nowhere to go after that you know that's it's a big deal yeah for sure um, it's a the logging you know that certainly leaves behind a much more dangerous place for them like as a human walking around it was uh, very challenging and. You know, I have to be extra careful that I'm not like, you know, twisting an ankle on on something that's not stable or yeah, there's just like shards of wood and debris. So it's it's yeah, it's a it's yeah, certainly a challenging thing to balance. You know, the needs of you know lumber and building homes and that sort of thing. But yeah, there's a lot of it's it's a tough one and. Yeah, there's not a lot of old growth left, you know, um, and these these wolves definitely make their home amongst the old growth, you know. Um, so coastal old growth is very important to coastal wolves, like, and all the other animals. They, <laughs> they, you know, Absolutely. Home. What do you, if we look in the future? I mean, these. It seems it's it's amazing because you said. You know, you started in 2019 with Seaforth and your 2020 really kicked up, but it seems everything is really snowballing for you for for Seaforth, which is in a good way in that there's, 
you're talking about the environmental change. You're talking about, you know, being a force for that positive stuff or really taking people on these incredible expeditions, being a lead person for the advocacy for these wolves. What do you think the future is going to hold for you and for Seaforth? Is it more into that? How do you see things playing out for you? Yeah, like I'm certain, I love to do the photo tours and, um, you know, the people that come out with, with me and that we, you know, you form these, you know, these friendships out there because we work really hard <laughs> for, you know, the, the shots um, and we endure, you know, it's a lot of take two fun, you know, um, and hopefully it, you know, it pays off and they get the, the photos that they came for and they all seem to be, you know, they're all of a like mind as far as, you know, our respect for the animal and, um, and how we use the photos, you know, um, uh, you know, for conservation efforts, there's, yeah, and quite a few people who've come out with me that, you know, they've donated their photos to Rain Coast and, um, you know, um, and other organizations as well. And um, so I certainly, you know, there's environmental stories that I'm keen to be a part of telling and facilitate, um, you know, as best I can. Um, and I definitely see myself moving more into uh, film because um, I think that's, it's just the, uh, it's, an amazing medium for telling stories and um and then my opportunities out there is as the guy who's probably out there the most um yeah i i have just amazing opportunities to be probably filming and documenting things so um i'll, I'll be moving that in that direction over the you know the course of the year sort of thing and um it's kind of hard because i you know i love the photography as well, you know, and, <laughs> but, uh, I'm sure I can do a bit of both. Yeah. But, no, it, yeah. it's great. Everything that you're doing is, is phenomenal. And I mean, we, you posted just a picture before we started on, uh, I think it was even, even the night before, uh, Thursday night and just asking everybody, you know, color or black and white and just the response that people give just for a simple post like that. So clearly your the circle that you're in, Clearly, people understand what you do. They love what you do. They the the photos that you get are are stunning, and the the work that's behind those photos clearly shows. And people know what you do. And this is our hope is that this conversation that we've had is will only bring more light to the things that you guys do, give you some more people your way and the funding and things like that. That's the whole point in having these conversations. Um, and it's just phenomenal. All and and all the good stuff that's coming your way. Uh, is just is great. So that's that's awesome. I love it, man. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. It's been a really amazing journey. You know, um, you stick your neck out, I guess, and good things come. Um, and yeah, I think the more I can do to, you know, put these animals in a positive light, and you know, I would love, I could, I see this opportunity for coastal wolves to kind of be a stepping stone for people, you know, eventually starting to feel the same way, maybe about timber wolves and that sort of thing. Um, Cause the coastal wolves don't really, you know, they they don't have as much of an effect on, I guess, people as maybe some of these or, you know, the perceived <laughs> effects, I guess, of the timber wolves uh, misaligned. Effects. Yeah, I know. Yeah. There's a lot of, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we try and walk that yeah. that line of being in the middle and having the radical conversation and wanting your people together as opposed to opposing. And I think you're doing a lot of that. So before before I let you go, because um, and please stay on after. I just want to make sure we get all information and stuff. So I have one more question, and then I want to promote everything else. So my last question for you, Tom, is when you hear the word wolf, what is the thing that comes to your mind? Uh, yeah, for me, it's uh, I have two words: home and family. Yeah, I don't, that's, I think it's partly because I'm close to where I used to live when I go out there and, and yeah, it's just, there's so much wrapped up in yeah, it. Yeah, that's great. I mean, they, and, and they are, they're our family, you know, they've told us how to be family, which is, it's been shown in a lot of the biology and stuff like that. It's, that's great. 
So tell everybody to, you know, the uh, what's the Instagram where they can follow you guys at? How can they find you online if they want to come up, book a, a photo tour, come and see you guys? Give them all the all the info on that. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> the um, uh, Instagram is a great way to find me, and it's just at Seaforth Expeditions. Um, and uh, yeah. To, if they if somebody did want to do a trip, they can email me at info at Seaforth Expeditions or Tom at Seaforth Expeditions. Um, but yeah, it can be hard to get a hold of. Uh, you know, I'm in the field a fair bit. Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, if, I, if you don't hear back, just be patient or email again, I would say. Um, but yeah, I post when I'm home. Uh, so if you see me posting online, that usually means I'm home. Uh, <laughs> so it's a bit sporadic. <laughs> I don't know. The social media is not really my bag, but um, yeah. Yeah. Uh. Yeah, no, you're killing it though. I mean, that's listen. I mean, your social media is great. I I found you guys. We started following them when we started our own handle, and immediately drawn to all the stuff you guys you guys did. So that's just it's phenomenal. So yeah, we'll have all the uh, all the info there in the description, guys, uh, for you for so you can take a look at them. Don't forget Island of the Sea Wolves. Uh, it's a uh, the documentary series. Uh, it's filmed uh, on Vancouver Island. Uh, it's coming to Netflix on October 11th. Will Arnett is the narrator of the series, and obviously all that footage, as Tom said, from the wolves uh, is from their uh, from their section and what they do. So, Tom McPherson, man, this is great. I'm so I'm glad that we we got our schedules together and that you were here and. Uh, yeah, man, this is just, this was so much fun. Thanks so much for making the time. We, uh, Steve and I really appreciate it. Yeah, no worries. It's nice to meet you. And uh, yeah, I look forward to listening to more of your podcast. Cool. Thanks cool. so much. How's the lay out there? And we'll be with you next time. Bye, everybody. Looking to support Wolf Connection or sponsor one of the wolves in our pack? Just go to wolfconnection.org, click on the donate tab, and find out more information. 